Under Education, English Speakers of Other Language, ESOL Program Overview. Wichita's ESOL program meets federal Title III mandates to provide English and academic instruction to second language learners. Tonight's presentation will provide an overview of the ESOL department's responsibilities and services. This presentation is for the board's information. Welcome, we're glad you're here. Thank you very much, good evening. Tonight, Stephanie Bird Hutchison and I will be talking about our English Speakers of Other Language program. We'll provide an overview as well as as we talk through the rich cultural diversity of our students. And we wanted to start off with the mission statement. Obviously, everything that we do ties in with the mission because we know that our students provide the background of whom we're working for. As we talk through tonight, we'll be showing pictures because we're visual, English speakers of other languages. We need not just to hear about it auditorily, but we need to see what we're talking about. The overview of our program tonight, we're gonna to talk about a description of our English language learners, followed by some legal history, how we identify our students, what instructional support we provide, look at our data assessment, and also we have some other programs through the Multilingual Educational Services Program that we'll discuss at the very end. First, we wanna talk a little bit about who our ELLs are and how we identify them. Um, the ELL is a student who has a language other than English in their home background, and they can be called uh, an ELL, EL, L2 learner, lots of different ways to, to call them. But the first um, thing that they're gonna learn when they come into school or into any English setting is the BICS, Basic Interpersonal Communication Skills. When our job really in the school system is the um, Cognitive Academic Language Proficiency the CALP, that's what we're trying to develop, that's what allows them to be successful in further education and in life. BICs are things that are very surface. This iceberg is very popular among ESOL folks because the BICs are what sticks up above the water that we can all see easily. It's the playground language. Most kids are gonna get that in six months. A few are gonna take a little bit longer than that. CALP, however, is that deep language that allows you to listen to a lecture and understand it, to write an essay, to, to be able to um, explain your reasoning. And that takes seven to 10 years to learn. In our most recent official um, enrollment information, we had 9,846 active ESOL students. We also had uh, more than 1,000 students on waivers and around, let's see, 635 students who exited proficient in the last two years and are being monitored. Those students have 109 different languages, 94 countries of birth. They include immigrants. The, the federal law um, defines those as students who've been in the country three years or less. Also are refugees and then long-term learners are often students who were born here but are, are from homes where a language other than English is primary and it, it, they're in that seven to 10 year time span of trying to get English skills. Now we have programs in 50 ESOL schools, 33 elementary, 12 middle, and five high schools, and we also have um, 12 newcomer programs in those schools. Gammon is our newest newcomer program. Uh, in large part because of our refugee population, we opened Gammon. There are a lot of students living up in that area that needed those services. As we look at the background of what brought on ESOL programs across the United States, we started off with Brown versus the Board of Education, 1954. We first started talking about separate but equal and found out that for ESOL students under the Equal Education Opportunities Act, just doing that is not enough. We can't put an, a student in a classroom who does not speak English and expect him or her to be successful. And so we started to move forward with some law interpretations and Lau versus Nichols in 1974 was one of those because we need to make sure that students who do not understand English are provided the appropriate educational access to academic instruction as well as English. Castaneda versus Pickard in 1981 followed up with this and gave a little bit of background on the Castaneda test. Theory, practice, and results means that we need to look at is it a sound theory of instruction, followed by is it implemented to the extent that it should be, 
And if it's not working, then we need to revamp and revise the program. And Title III is the federal program mandates that look at how we provide and actually track our data on learning English as well as the language testing that we do in order to meet the core academic requirements. Um, Multilingual Educational Services, the MES Center, is located at Dunbar Service Center. There we have our intake center for newcomers. All families that come to Wichita who have a language other than English in their home come first to the MES Center to enroll the students. Um, the home language survey is done as the first step at the school. And if anything is marked of those four questions that says, yes, there's another language, then they're to be directed to us. This has helped greatly in compliance. It's been huge. Um, once they reach us, we have staff who can help parents in any language they're bringing with those enrollment forms and get all that done. But we also test the students and determine what kind of ESOL placement they're going to need. Um, are they going to need a newcomer program, regular ESL? Are they fluent? And those are the things we try to work out there and then get them routed to the correct school so that they don't start at one school and then have to move later. So these are our basic placement options that we um, determine and discuss with parents there. And as we move into the core classrooms, we are required also to provide instructional support because all students must have that opportunity to learn and meet those same high standards. Within the Fund 14 program, and that's what we're officially designated, the bilingual Fund 14, we have 50 ESL schools, and in those schools we have 143 teachers, 73 paraprofessionals, three ESL coaches, and an MES specialist, as well as the professional development that comes to the Board of Education every year through Newman for the classes that we allow teachers at those schools to take and participate in. Opportunities or support models for our students, we start within class within class. Obviously, we want the students to be in the core as much as possible. That could be individual, small group, co-teaching. We do pull outs as well in conjunction with class within class. And we also look for those tier two and three interventions to make sure that the students are getting those multiple data measures to find out what gaps they have to catch them up to what they need to be in the core. We talk about vocabulary there in reading comprehension because in addition to just simply, simply understand, uh, going through decoding, they need to be doing things. This is one of my favorite slides because it does show that as we are practicing, just listening like I'm doing right now in a lecture method is going to result in very little retention. The higher up you get in discussion groups, practicing and teaching others, results in higher educational attainment. We need opportunities for our students to practice, for them to work through, for them to have those learning opportunities with small groups and partners. And that's why we took a, take a look at how we can get them actively involved through total participation techniques. Vocabulary and reading comprehension, it goes beyond the phonemic awareness, phonics and fluency. We want to scaffold, and, and part of these are th terms that you are familiar with because the ESOL program ties very much into what the district initiatives are. We support and we supplement in order to help our students be successful within the core. Tier one and two allows for the scaffolding, and tier three pushes in for the more intensive groups. Within the English and academic instruction, we do look at literacy, which is reading, writing, listening, and speaking, but we also take the Kansas College and Career Ready Standards and look at the fifth area of language, which are those thinking and processing skills. How do we help those students understand the language instead of just sitting there and following along or, or trying to participate but being left out? This is a quick little graphic showing that listening, speaking, reading, and writing are all part of an instructional lesson, a classroom lesson that would help the students to interact with the material. As you strategically group students in small groups, partners, maybe even larger groups, and, and they prepare and present, there are a lot of opportunities for writing, for conversate, uh, talking together, and as you can see, the result is a very positive interactive piece. We're not looking for the lecture with our students because they need opportunities to process in order to close that word gap that they carry with them. The artifacts that they put out, once again, are rich because they bring with them their backgrounds, their cultural experience, 
and those opportunities help our students become academically connected to the school. As a district connection within the instructional protocol, we have the I do, we do, and you do. We're pushing forward on the Marzano DQ three and four, which is that higher level, more opportunities to interact and be independent uh, to apply the learning. Depth of knowledge, DOK levels three and four, we're looking at for strategic thinking as well as extended learning opportunities. We want our students to go deeper, and this is true for all of our students, and so even though tonight we're talking about ESL strategies and an overview, this would be true for all of our students in the district because learning opportunities come from good teaching. As we look at our data, we have some Ames Web and the Kansas English Language Performance Assessment, which is the KELPA. And within that, the literacy, we're going to start off with the Ames Web. Elementary literacy, we, back in 2013, we had 59% of our students uh, uh, successful or, or at the 25th percent at the green and above. 2016, 63 with a growth of 5% and accuracy was 5% as well. Secondary maze is more of a vocabulary, I won't call it a complete comprehension because it doesn't go that deep, but as you look at some of the vocabulary word and development, the middle schools have grown, students have grown 17% over the last four years. English language performance, once again leading towards that Kansas English language performance assessment, KELPA, it's collected individually yearly and we also look at the overall number of students who have reached proficient for two years in a row. English language proficiency this last year is the 2015 because it's done once a year. We had 1,670 students who met their first year of proficiency and of those we had 504 students who met the second year proficiency as well. So those are the ones who are reclassified and 463 of those were returning students and 41 who either graduated or left the area. Now one thing I wanted to bring out is as we look at the data, part of what we need to understand is that ESOL is a revolving door. The students who enter in kindergarten are needing the extra help and support. Our newcomers, our refugees, the immigrants who come to us, they test into the ESOL program because they specifically need those supports. What we also recognize is we are successful when we help them become proficient and test out of the program after two years. So overall, we continue to look at high populations of need and some of our refugee students come to us with no English and no academics from the refugee camps and you can kind of read about that in the program that Stephanie prepared for you. I call those tier four because they're not even at the tier four, three level for us. We're providing during the newcomer classrooms that basic instructional English and academics even all the way through some of our middle and high school students. Also, once we get exited based on the KELPA, we do monitor them for two years, but it's an in and out cycle. And so we're continuously probably about 10% behind the district just on literacy assessments because it's the in and out. The students who are on out the door do continue to be very successful and we monitor for those for two years. MES, as I said before, has the intake center. We also have the language line in our offices. Um, we provide interpretation in almost any language that a parent would need. There are two that we haven't been able to find of those 109, and even our uh, proprio service has not been able to find those two. So we have um, currently about 30 different languages that we can provide face-to-face -face interpretation more than 200 different languages that we can provide by the phone. Um, and that's all in our language line and in our interpretation and translation. In our translation written services, we um, translate all of those special ed documents that are required by law, as well as any district letters. And we are now translating things into Spanish and Vietnamese, which we've had for a long time but we've recently added Arabic, Swahili, French, German, and Mandarin, and there are some other languages that we can access locally, and if not, if it's a legally required document, we um, go ahead and pay Propio to do that interpretation translation for us. In addition, we have adult ESOL that is um, centered in our office. 
It is open to parents of USD 259 students. Uh, we have beginning and intermediate programs uh, in several locations throughout the city. And currently this year we've served about 280 adult learners. Those 280 adult learners are probably representing around 600 children in our schools whose parents are continuing their education and becoming more literate and comfortable in English. The Migrant Education Program is another program that is at MES. Um, it is for the children of people who have worked either in agriculture or have attempted to find jobs in agriculture related fields like Tyson, um, down in Ark City, Creekstone, Treetop. Um, if they've had to move within three years and they've sought that kind of work, then they're eligible for migrant education. Nationally, these children are the most at risk of failure and a dropout. Uh, so our program right now serving 186 kids. Um, we provide academic support, tutoring, credit accrual for the high school kids. We do all sorts of family learning activities for them. And we also do social service referrals because again, if the kid is not well or doesn't have clothes or food, they're not gonna do well when they come to school to learn. So we connect those. In closing, way back, Confucius used to say, I hear and I forget, I see and I remember, I do and I understand. It's the same today in education. We want our students to be actively busy, to be participating with the teachers and English speakers of other languages is a vibrant program for our district. Any questions? Ms. Arnold? Um, yeah, and thank you for a, a great presentation. And listening to you, it sounds like we're doing a great job, but I, I wanna ask you this uh, because I don't know if there's a comparison model or something that would tell us how we're doing versus other districts, other states that would have a similar makeup. Can you put that in, in some kind of pr perspective for me? I can partially. Um, the Office of Civil Rights obviously takes a look at all programs across the United States. And several school districts have, have once you know, out of compliance or whatever. Uh, we are a cohort one for the state of Kansas and there are 50 different questions for title programs that we answer. And we were audited last year and passed all of our programs. Uh, in comparison, we're looking at very similar scores probably in, in what we're doing. Uh, I would say that that 10% behind the other, the regular ed students is, is for long-term learners and students of immigrant programs, uh, that, that's something that we continually try to overcome as we move students more proficient. Uh, specific scores beyond that, I, I don't have at this okay. time. All right, thanks. Mm. Ms. Fuller? <laughs> I uh, picked up on the additional MES programs, mm -hmm. adult ESOL, and migrant mm -hmm. education programs. Do, are those at the same time of day, or are the kids at the school and the parent coming into another place? Um, the adult the ESOL program, we have six classrooms running in the mornings. Uh, if they have preschoolers, the preschoolers, the kids who aren't in school yet, we do provide childcare, trained childcare for them. Uh, in the afternoon, we have two classes, again, with childcare for the kids who aren't old enough to attend school yet. And then in the evening, we have five programs throughout the city, uh, childcare for the littlest ones, but we also hire certified teachers to come in and run kids club. So the, the children of the adults who are attending have an opportunity to come to our sites and get help with homework or tutoring or play educational games under the supervision of a certified teacher. So would some of that be considered pre-K kind of thing, working with those kids young as they're going to begin to make yes. connections? Yes, we, um, our daycare workers get training about every two weeks on specific issues as well as how to work with the children and, and develop their skills. Where is the training from? Is that something you do? We do it internally, yes. Internally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is phenomenal, phenomenal. Thank you. you see these kids in the grocery store and at the shopping centers, and they just look like they know what to do. They've mm -hmm. got this system figured out. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have a question, and it's on page 19 of your slides uh, about the performance. I just want to make sure I understand. I know that our students come in and they take the, the KALPA test. Um, 
before they are proficient and are able to take the regular state assessment, correct? They, they are exempt from English language arts for one year. That's all that the federal government will allow us to exempt them from. So they do take K-ELPA or whatever the state has designated that year as the statewide assessment. So on the second year, if they're not proficient with, which most of them would not be yet, simply Correct. because of time, do they, they still take, take tests? Yes. So we And are they all take math from third grade up, no matter what. So they arrive in our doorstep, they speak no English at all, mm -hmm. and the first year they're taking math assessments for state assessments, and the second year they're taking language arts, correct? Yes. Um, they are participation only that first year on math, so they're not counting for other data, only for the fact that they took it. But, but the, second the second year, year, they year count, don't it, they? it counts fully. And it counts for both subjects, correct? Yes. How many, uh, we have 9,000 some 800 students. 800 yeah. something, yeah. Uh, currently, how does that look as far as growth over time? How Three. many students are we adding each oh, year? Uh, we're adding, um, our numbers of newcomers have gone up each year lately. So, so we are adding annually. Part of that is the refugee influx. We used to have a growth about 6% in the mm -hmm. district of incoming because we went from the 6,000 like about 10 years ago to 9,800 now. And over the last couple of years, we've started to even out a little bit. And instead of our in immigrants coming from Mexico, they are more likely to be coming from overseas, uh, from Congo and Africa. I think part of that might be the economic times. It's a lot tougher for s certain students. And so there's more, you know, they're looking for the jobs and the job bar markets that are out there. In regards to the KELPA annu Annual Measurable a uh, Academic Outcomes, AMAOs, uh, the KELPA has been revised over the last three years, and so once again, you can't have current data or, or background. Uh, we have the KELPA P, which is the placement, which is different than the KELPA, which is different than KELPA, which we're currently doing. Um, but, in the past, <laughs> <laughs> but in mm -hmm. the past, but in the past of the two, one is you want to have a baseline for individual students so you can show growth, because that's number one. And the second AMAO would be the proficiency. And so we're tracking both. The third part we're trying to le level in is the exited monitored because we want to put a little marker in synergy for those students to continue to be tracked and progressed over future years because if we could include those in our total outcome, it would short it close that achievement gap even more even though we don't get credit for them at this time. Interesting report, and, and this page, this extra handout that shows all the countries that our students come from, that's very telling. We literally are getting kids from everywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. So, Thank you. I see no other comments. Thank you very much for your report. We appreciate it. Thanks.